And we're back with the third part of Female Breadwinners and Divorce. In this one, we'll be going over a study titled, When She Brings Home the Job Status, Wives' Job Status, Status Leakage, and Marital Instability, which I do believe gets at the heart of what's going on in these female breadwinner, or as Washington Post reporter Liza Mundy refers to them, breadwomen relationships. More on her later. The study starts off with a concept established in academia as the Oscar curse, and the authors explain it with a life example of actress Sandra Bullock. It seems that in 2009, she received a number of awards, including an Academy Award, was selected as 2010's People Magazine Actress of the Year, and to top it all off, made more money than any other actress in that same year. She was also in a marriage during this time, and at the same time as she received all of this newfound status, she elected to file for divorce. This is what is referred to as the Oscar curse as, although we do not see a spike in divorces by men who win an Academy Award, we see almost double the amount by women. Additionally, an example from Liza Mundy's 2012 book, The Richer Sex, How the New Majority of Female Breadwinners is Transforming Sex, love, and family, is stated which provides a telling account of one of these breadwomen's experience of earning more than her husband. To put it succinctly, she wasn't happy, and began to genuinely resent her husband over time. Reading this brief passage, I became curious what else this woman had to say, and thought that you would want to know as well, so I bought a copy of the book. What her situation came down to was that early on, she and her husband had equal salaries, but upon becoming a doctor, hers tripled. They started a family, and as she made the most money, the husband stayed home to take care of their two sons. At first, the husband struggled a bit with his new role, while she felt she was prepared to be the breadwinner. Over time, however, their mindsets switched, in that the husband became comfortable staying home, and she became uncomfortable with the situation, as he continued his duties while working a part-time job. Although he was great at being a father and taking care of the house, as she states, I found myself respecting him less as a man, and I learned that despite all of the feminist drive that I'd had through the years, I thought a man should also, even if the woman is a breadwinner, carry his weight with the couple. I felt he was not doing that, and the tension started to mount. I'm working my butt off. Where is your contribution? I'm toting the load here. Quite obviously, she felt that the man had become a burden, lost respect for him, and this becomes all the more apparent in her account of perceiving that her ability to earn was directly facilitating this behavior in her husband. Now, as a consequence of this, she decided to sleep in another room as she came to the realization at 15 years into the marriage that, I don't feel anything for this guy anymore. I've just come to the end of my rope. I hate to say this, I want to sit back and be taken care of. I'm tired. I joke about it. But I really will not enter into another relationship unless he is financially stable. The whole point of life is living and learning. It's got to be more than a nice guy. This is essentially the playing out over 15 years of a statement I made in response to Tommy Lahren. Proclaiming that men should find you more attractive because you, quote unquote, have something going on is more or less as effective as men trying to convince women they're attractive because they have a good heart and are a good person. To an extent, I would say that the author agrees with this in considering her statement that the real impediment in the short term may be women themselves, and by this she means that many women will not be able to get over the idea of the male provider being the only role men are to serve in a relationship for them. As the example sheds light on, these women are not willing to take on the sacrificial role men have traditionally occupied for time immemorial. Now, of course, this dynamic will not invariably result in an unsuccessful relationship. Even as was shown in the last segment, a lowered relationship satisfaction trend was found when the woman started out-earning her partner. But this was to a lesser extent when she harbored a more egalitarian mindset regarding gender roles. An additional factor that comes to mind is one I've talked about previously, the Savannah Theory of Happiness, which explains that intelligence has been thought to play a role in our perceptions of novel stimuli as, 
The more intelligent the individual, the more likely they are to succeed in adapting to novelty. Due to this, it has been thought that less intelligent individuals would have a harder time adapting to novel factors such as problems or environments, and this would take a toll on their well-being or happiness. For example, in an ancestral environment, we may have resided in groups of about 150 people, otherwise known as Dunbar's number. In accordance with the Savannah theory of happiness, less intelligent individuals may face a significant decrease in well-being when faced with an environment not paralleling with the one we evolved in. In accordance with this theory, and in considering the example from the book, what we have is a husband that, although at first was uncomfortable, adapted, and a wife that couldn't. Of course, we must also consider that sitting back and being taken care of as the woman desired is rather easy regardless of how intelligent you are or your gender. And with the stark contrast between this dynamic and being able to directly observe the traditional role of their mothers, a sense of unfairness may be perceived by women. Additionally, we must consider how the acquisition of status by proxy to a higher status man plays a significant role, specifically in women's mating preferences, but not men's. And this brings us to the purpose of the study to see whether this Oscar effect has significance in relationships outside of those containing Academy Award winning wives, why this happened in the first place, and in conducting this experiment, they established the concept of wives of status leakage, which parallels what I've been suspecting and why I've stated on multiple occasions that women shouldn't settle by their standards. The concept asserts that by wives possessing higher status than their husbands, this will manifest in negative feelings and thoughts towards the husband due to the imbalance being perceived by the wife as leeching from her own status and thus damaging it. In essence, this is reminiscent of my dog in her purse video in that the husband, amongst his other roles, serves as a sort of accessory to the woman to garner status and attention from. The authors further go on to emphasize that status here may be subjective, and so while a man who is, say, a plumber, may objectively make more money than someone with a higher status title, such as a CEO, it is a title that can play a more significant role here. Moreover, they touch on how this status leakage may contribute to marriage dissatisfaction, in that it would manifest in contempt for the husband, the belittling of him to assert one's superiority, and therefore, the deterioration of the wife's respect. This is yet another example which parallels with my previous story about the woman belittling her husband which, if I recall correctly, she did state that she makes more money than him. As the authors state as well, others could be proud of their wives' higher career success, perceiving it within the context of a partnership rather than a status competition. I completely agree with this. There will be those men who are completely fine with pairing with higher earning women and are not trying to become a power couple, as many women state they desire, which, in all actuality, means that she requires the man to surpass her in status while she simultaneously pursues her own, thus generating her own status in the eyes of other women by her own efforts, and augmented by deriving status by proxy to her husband, or rather, teacup-sized dog in her designer purse. So, in order to test their predictions, the authors surveyed 209 Canadian females who were executives along with 53 of their husbands. And what they found was that wives with more status did report more status leakage, and that the greater the leakage, the lower the relationship satisfaction, which resulted in higher instability of the marriage. However, it was found that not through providing emotional, but instrumental support, meaning physical support facilitating a partner's work pursuits, that as this form of support increased, the wife's job status had less of an effect on the stability of the marriage. In essence, the Oscar curse does have the potential to play out regardless of whether the wife wins the award or not. So we may be able to refer to this as the bread or bacon curse. Personally, I like the latter more. It has a nice ring to it. And this effect was also found to last over a three-year period, so it is quite the curse. In a recent video by Big Think, interviewing Professor Brian Kloss, talking about the problem of people with dark triad traits, such as psychopaths, find themselves in positions of power, they asked him the following question. Why does society often fail to screen out bad leaders? Part of his response was asking the question of, 
why don't we train people to tell them this is about to happen to you? Why don't we tell a prime minister or a president who's just been thrust into the job, look, we understand that you've just won this campaign. You need to take a step back and understand that your mind is about to change. And it's about to change because we know it's about to change based on all sorts of empirical evidence from neuroscience and psychology and all sorts of other sources. And therefore, here's how you can maybe counteract this or mitigate those effects. This was with reference to negative traits manifesting following the taking on of a role and would likely, however, only work in the case of regular people who find themselves abruptly in a position of power as opposed to a psychopath. One example that comes to mind was the bias of jurors when observing someone attractive. When they were informed of this effect, the bias decreased. The authors provide a similar take on a preemptive measure to aid women in traversing the dating market when pursuing an education that may result in a high earning position. They state, in addition, women who aspire to high status positions should be aware that not all aspects of high status jobs are positive, but that with a supportive partner, potential costs to one's personal life can be prevented. Given the findings of this study, we suggest that in addition to any career discussions, family choices and priorities should also be considered explicitly and early in women's careers, for example, during training opportunities for women in programs geared towards high-status occupations, for example, MBA programs, medical and law school, and leadership development workshops. In the sense that forewarned is forearmed, such information can help women actively take preventive steps to avoid unintended negative effects. Nonetheless, we would be remiss if we did not reiterate that this is not a women's issue. Our findings reiterate that men who are married to women in higher job status positions are equally impacted, such that they too experience the effects of marital instability. Open and honest discussions about the changing nature of women in the workforce and how this can impact marital relationships in general are important for both partners in the marriage. As Liza Money predicts, over time, we will all adapt to a world of female breadwinners. This all, however, may not solve the issue of women's loss of sexual attraction to their husbands when taking on the breadwinner role. As previous research has shown, it is when the man takes on what is considered traditionally male housework such as yard work, that more sex occurs. Perhaps as with the finding that women with less traditional views on gender roles reported less relationship dissatisfaction when they started to earn more than their partners, the relationships with these women would face less of a decline in sexual frequency when the man takes on less traditional housework. Or, perhaps men in female breadwinner relationships in taking on the bulk of the housework, traditionally female tasks included, will find themselves in a relationship that is satisfying in the other dimensions besides sex. Everything in the home is alive and well, except the bedroom. Of course, this is not to say that sex may not be occurring elsewhere, in the case of the wife or the husband. As Dr. David Buss states, according to the mate switching hypothesis, adaptations for monitoring potential alternatives to one's current mate should remain activated post mate selection even among those in happy relationships. If my prediction is correct, this places the man in a double bind. Essentially, he is damned if he does the dishes and damned if he doesn't. Post your thoughts in the comments section, and if you happen to know someone or are in a female breadwinner relationship yourself, your experiences will provide valuable input.